We've asked a handful of our friends on Capitol Hill to share their experiences and talk with us about how they've navigated this shift, both in Congress and on the campaign trail. First, we're going to turn to Congressman Peter Welch from Vermont. Well, it's gone back and forth in many different ways. I mean, the commitment in Congress to the security of Israel has been rock solid ever since I've been there. The pro-diplomacy approach where we have a coalition in Congress that is absolutely committed to the two-state solution, that's been under stress. And of course, in the past four years, it was very stressed with the alliance between uh, President Trump and President Netanyahu, and then the aggressive occupation or uh, annexation policies that were being pursued in Israel and supported in, uh, in, uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, we now, with uh, President Biden, I think are fully committed to a diplomacy first approach. And uh, we have to build that support with the help of J Street in Congress. But what has been consistent from when I first went to Congress to now is that those of us who believe uh, in the pro-diplomacy approach first are absolutely committed to the two-state solution as the best way to guarantee that there is justice and that there is a very strong Jewish democratic state of Israel. We sometimes are inhibited in our debate about issues that are incredibly fiercely debated in Israel. And one of the most wonderful experiences I had was an early J Street trip I took, where questions in Israel, like uh, what the right word is with respect to Israelis' uh, involvement in the West Bank, um, on the question of annexation, <clears throat> on the question of the two-state solution, all of these things were fiercely debated in the vital democracy we have in Israel. Whereas in Washington, I often times found that when there was a discussion about these issues, uh, there was an accusation that if you were even having the discussion that was important to Israelis, somehow you were not showing your strongest support for Israel. That's changing. And I think in Congress, we're seeing that many of these questions that Israelis debate constantly are ones that we have to debate, uh, given our relationship with Israel. We have to do that in Congress, all with the goal of having a strong and vibrant uh, peace uh, in, in, the, in the Middle East between Israeli uh, citizens and Palestinians. J Street is incredibly important in this. It's been absolutely essential because what it's done is given space for us to have the serious debates about the implications of policies and how they may interfere with or enhance that goal of that two-state solution. So with the backing of J Street uh, and the credibility that it has in Congress uh, and as an organization that is totally committed to the security of Israel, it's possible for us to have this discussion about is it really wise, is it really fair uh, for there to be annexation, or what really is the impact uh, of settlements on our long-term ability to reach that goal of a two-state solution. So uh, J Street has been extremely helpful in creating that space for there to be what is not only legitimate debate, but essential debate if we're gonna get to where we want to go with that two-state solution. Israel is a democratic as well as a Jewish state. And democratic means, small d democratic, means that we all have a, a respect for the rights of others. And those small d democratic values are to strive for peace, to strive for coexistence, to strive for mutual respect, and to establish structures uh, that best give us the opportunity to achieve those small d democratic goals. Hi everyone, that was Congressman Peter Welch who has spent a lot of time in the region. You heard him reference that he went on one of our inaugural J Street trips to the region. Um, I really, I wrote down two things. One, I really liked this notion. He talked about a strong and dynamic debate is what leads to a strong and dynamic peace in the Middle East. I thought that was great. Um, and he also talked about how wrestling with these issues is legitimate. And not only is it legitimate, but it's in fact necessary. 
Um, I'm sure that our next live guest can reflect on all of this. So let's give a very warm welcome to our next live guest, Con Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Hello, Hi everybody. There. Hello, everybody. Hey. Oh, it's so nice to have you. Well, I'm really We're so thrilled. glad to have you join us. I, I'm, I'm actually here live, and I really appreciate it. You are definitely live, and we are so glad to have you. Uh, we are looking forward to getting your input on some of the political questions we've already started talking about tonight. Something that Congressman Welch mentioned, which we also heard earlier from Ben Rhodes, is how the perception of being pro-Israel has changed over time, and that being pro-Israel, pro-peace, pro-diplomacy, and supporting a two-state solution are not mutually exclusive. Congresswoman, what does it mean to you to be pro-Israel in 2021? Well, in I'm able to actually express all my feelings about Israel being pro-Israel, but also talking about the important progressive ways that we can express that. Um, and um, it's a big change from when I got to the United States Congress. I want to tell you that uh, J Street really changed my life for the better. Uh, when I got there in, in 1999, it was one of those situations that you've heard about where if you even blinked um, in a different way, um, about Israel, um, given the, st the standard definition of what it meant to be pro-Israel, you were suspect. Um, and it was a very difficult time for progressives who love Israel, but also want justice for the Palestinians and a two-state solution. Um, and But J Street came to my rescue, particularly in 2010 when I was uh, running against a, a Jewish uh, Republican who um, I wasn't pro-Israel enough, I wasn't Jewish enough, um, but, Israel, but J Street came and endorsed me and helped me. Um, and it was a, a, a moment that really, as I say, changed my life. That's fantastic. You've been such a great ally to us in our work here. Um, and incidentally, I also started working on the Hill in 99, and I really obviously appreciate and understand the environment that, um, that was there at the time. Um, Congresswoman, J Street has been really pleased, as I'm sure you have, to see the increasing numbers of foreign policy and national security experts that have been elected to Congress of late. We're going to take a few minutes and hear from some of these voices on the Hill about why this experience is so important. Many of these members were first elected as part of a historic wave that helped retake the House in 2018 and dubbed the National Security Freshmen. They helped serve as a check on Donald Trump's worst foreign policy instincts, and they won re-election in some of the most competitive districts in the country. So let's hear from some of these J Street allies and we'll come back in just a few minutes for some further thoughts. Right now, our politics are unfortunately got roots into every aspect of our governance. And this I think is a problem. I'm somebody that comes at the work that I do as a former diplomat. I worked under both Republicans and Democrats. I served as a career public servant and I swore the oath to our Constitution and our country, I always learned that uh, the saying that when I worked at the State Department, that the last place that partisan politics belongs is in our national security, that we don't want people in the situation room making these kinds of decisions, thinking about politics, thinking about partisanship, but unfortunately it is creeping in there. The American people do care about foreign policy. I, I challenge that question and that assumption that, that foreign policy does not drive votes. In my district, we have a joint military base here. We have many people from my community that have served out in the Middle East, some who lost their lives when they went off to war and combat. People here care, and it means a lot. In my, in my district, national security is a local issue. So I really do think that people understand that when we're talking about foreign policy, in particular about our relationship to Israel, we're talking about this fundamental question of what does America stand for? What does America's handshake mean in 2021? And that is something that we need to be able to push forward on. And if we dilute that, 
or water that down or weaken that because of partisanship, then we are inherently weakening our hand abroad. We're weakening our ability to be the kind of superpower and global force that we all want us to be. What it means to, for me to be pro-Israel and goes back to one of the, the, the questions that, that, that I just got, it's an extension of my belief that American foreign policy is grounded in values as well as interests. Obviously, there are, there are practical interests that are served by the United States uh, working with uh, Israel and encouraging a two-state solution and, and a successful conclusion to the peace process. Um, but there are also fundamental values that, that are important to us as Americans and I think to most Israelis that, that are caught up in this relationship. And I want American foreign policy to wrestle with, 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 with our moral obligations. Um, and that's, that's to me what, what, what caring about, uh, this partnership, um, it, it, it is all about. That's, that's why I think it should be defended, but also that we should, um, always hold ourselves, Americans and Israelis to the values that are, that are foundational to the partnership. I think there's some challenges at times in the political sphere talking about major national security priorities because national security priorities are never um, easy. They're full of nuance. They're they're full of kind of challenges on all sides. They're very complex issues. What are U.S. interests? How do we engage with our foreign partners? What are the challenges we're facing that may be economic or social, or you know the list goes on and on. And sometimes I think in the political sphere. Uh, conversations are, are you for this or are you against this? And it's just not that binary in the world of national security or foreign policy. Uh, and so I think that those of us who have a background in national security and certainly those of us in Congress who work on national security and, and foreign um, uh, diplomacy priorities need to ensure that we are always making that clear to our constituents that this is not a, a yes or no policy question. This is actually an issue full of nuance uh, full of uh, the potential for unintended consequences or issues that we should be thinking through as we make decisions. Uh, and so we should be not only doing that due diligence in our decision making, but communicating it well to our constituencies as well. We need to have uh, an open and creative conversation about the path forward in the Middle East and not be constrained by the policy formulas, conventions, and rhetoric that have prevailed for the last 30 years without results. And I look forward to engaging with uh, the community at J Street and the broader pro-Israel community and the community of uh, civil society groups, organizations uh, who are promoting a peaceful settlement to this conflict to identify a real path forward, get beyond rhetoric that's too often empty uh, and determine how we can really make progress delivering peace for people living in the Middle East who just want those same basics out of life that everybody on earth does. I think it's incredibly damaging if we let Israel become a wedge issue either between Democrats and Republicans or within the Democratic Party. Uh, and it's something that I experienced firsthand uh, during my uh, election. And I think that it's very important, and I get asked about this a lot, especially as a young person and a young progressive, uh, about how we can make sure we're still having young progressives who support uh, this bilateral relationship, the US-Israel relationship. And I think it's incredibly important that we are able to separate legitimate criticism of the policies of the state of Israel, just like we have legitimate criticisms of the policies of the United States of America, from having that being called anti-Semitic or uh, having it seen as being anti-Israel. And I actually think that the most pro-Israel thing we can do right now is push to have US policy that creates the conditions conducive to a peace settlement. And that makes sure that we're not uh, using U.S. assets to do things that uh, make it harder to get to that peace agreement or um, make it harder to have a country that really seems aligned with our values. And so to me, it's about making sure we're actually infusing our uh, progressive values in our pro-Israelness. I don't think that they um, are uh, 
things that are in conflict at all. Um, and, you know, from my point of view as a Jewish woman uh, who grew up in the Jewish community in San Diego and, and has family in Israel, uh, I, I know my values, I know where I stand, and I feel very confident in in speaking up both about what I see as wrong in the United States and what I see as wrong in Israel. And I hope that we can create the space for more people to feel like they are able to do that as well. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks again for, to the members that we just heard from. Uh, as a reminder, we just heard from Congress members Andy Kim, Tom Malinowski, and Abigail Spamberger, and two of our newest Jewish members, Senator John Ossoff and Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. They were terrific, terrifically articulate, and just uh, great members of Congress. Congresswoman Schakowsky, I want to pick up on what Representative Spamberger said about foreign policy being complex and full of no nuance. That there are no binary choices when it comes to foreign policy. And let's face it, it's just not black or white. How do you navigate complex foreign policy issues when Republicans are constantly trying to politicize support of Israel? Well, I guess my experience with the, um, with the um, JCPOA uh, made it really clear how complicated it, it could be. But we put together, under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi, an incredible whip team that was able to clarify those issues, that this was a matter of making sure that uh, we did not have a war in the, in the, in the Middle East, that we were able to talk about um, actually preventing that by making sure that Iran did not have nuclear weapons, that that was the most important thing right now. Um, and, and so we were able to go literally door to door, person to person, um, and, and talk to them, uh, to, our, to our colleagues, and, and get enough votes. Um, and I, I wanna say people like Jerry Nadler, who comes from a heavily um, Jewish district, I think the most in the, in the country. Um, and at the end of the day, the majority of Jews in the Congress voted for, uh, you know, to, for the JCPOA um, and, and we were successful. It's even more complicated now, but I would say even more important now and fortunately, we have a president who was part of those negotiations then and is now helping to navigate navigate now. And, and while there may not be binary choices, at the end of the day, we want to have the right conclusion. And we are hoping so, you know, I don't want to say desperately, but certainly um, enthusiastically, about um, making sure that we're able to reach this agreement once again. Um, and fortunately, uh, with, with a president who believes that we have to um, deal, with, uh, deal with Iran, that we have to deal with them, even though they may be bad actors, which they are, um, in order to bring, to, to bring peace. So yes, all of our foreign policy experts are, are right. It's complicated, but we know that there's a job to do to keep um, peace in the, in the region and then keep peace in the world. Thank you. I know there's been a perception for many years that taking certain pro-diplomacy stances on the campaign trail might hurt candidates in their election prospects. But as Jess said earlier, that hasn't actually been the case. In 2016, every Democrat who supported the JCPOA won the re-election. And we've seen yeah. this largely continue in 2018 and 2020 with pro-diplomacy candidates winning their elections. Why do you think that's the case? The answer is J Street. I don't think that's an exaggeration. The space that J Street opened up for these kinds of conversations and the safety that J, St J Street has provided for, for candidates. You know, when I got my endorsement of J Street in 
2010, um, people would say, oh, you're, you're very brave to take their endorsement. And now every election cycle, I get calls, how can I get the endorsement of J Street? Um, because um, J Street weighs in, J Street helps mobilize allies to, uh, to help uh, candidates, um, does polling that reassures candidates that they're on the right track and can win their elections. And these election cycles that we've had have proven that to be true. So um, I, I really do credit J Street for creating safe space for opening up the, the conversation in a way that has been so productive for diplomacy to flourish.